name is Emma Misha. I work at Stanley Bank. I'm the head of corporate and investment banking as well as the executive director. I did social work for university. I did SWASA at Makere University. I was a loan officer for three and a half years. So I went to the Netherlands, did my MBA, and when I came back, I joined Citibank. Uh, three and a half years later, I joined Barclays. Then after that, I joined Stanbeck as head of transactional products and services. And two years ago, I was promoted to head of corporate and investment bank. So 20 something years career, but very exciting. So I'm really excited about partnering with NSSF um, in the expo, the career expo. Uh, if you just finished your university, one thing I realized is that your initial degree doesn't actually matter. It's almost like, get it, tick that box. In banking, we've got, we've got a doctor, we've got lawyers, we've got uh, engineers, lots of engineers. So your first degree, it doesn't define you. Uh, it can just be a stepping stone to the career that you want. The NSSF Career Expo gives you an opportunity to resources, to people, to experiences that are important for you as you look to plan and, 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 and implement your career goals. There's a link below that you can sign up and secure your place at that expo. I encourage you to sign up and to join us as we discuss all these great ideas and give you tips on what has worked for us and what has been uh, good for our careers. My name is Sike Japheth. I lead the team at Innovation Village, which is Uganda's launchpad for leading entrepreneurs, creatives, who are solving big, broken problems using technology. We've also most recently expanded into the creative space by building Motive, which is a playground for creatives in wood, fashion, metal, art, and uh, media and entertainment. What COVID has taught us is that nobody has all the answers. But as a young person, you suddenly realize that anyone can contribute to bring solutions to life. The question is simple, really. Um, if you're thinking about what career can I get into, you have to go back and say, what problems, big problems, problems that are affecting millions of people, do I care about and how do I turn those problems into a business opportunity? I'm also very excited to be part of the NSSF Career Expo. We shall be discussing how you can repurpose your career in light of the new normal and I encourage you to sign up, join the conversation and be part of the change we want to see in this country. NSSF, a better life. Hello everybody, my name is Ron Kawamara. I'm CEO of Jumia Uganda. I'm very excited to participate in the NSSF Career Expo 21, which begins on March 24th to the 26th. Um, this year's theme is even more timely, that is repurposing your career goals for the new normal. I look forward to sharing with you and learning from you and learning with you so please sign up at nssfug.org forward slash career expo 21. See you then. NSSF, a better life. My name is Sandra Twinobrio. I am a news anchor currently working with NTV Uganda. I am also an entrepreneur in fashion, youth guidance, and also digital marketing. Well, my career journey actually started when I was at school. You know, I, I initially wanted to be a lawyer, but when I saw I couldn't get into law school at that point, I decided to look at my best second option, and that was journalism. I am excited, delighted, and looking forward to being the moderator of this year's NSSF Career Expo, that focuses on guiding young people to make the right career choices. Moving ahead, they'll get out of university and they will have to think of what to do. This expo is the right avenue for them to talk to different practitioners in different industries, 
pick some ideas on what to do, when and how. But we have amazing guest speakers. Among these, we have CK Jaffith uh, from the Innovation Village. We also have Emma Msha from Stonebeek and Juliana Kagwa from UBL. I believe these are people that come with a wide range of knowledge and young people have to use this opportunity to exploit it to the maximum, to learn as much as possible. So please do follow the link and register for the NSSF Career Expo. You definitely didn't want to miss it. My name is Emma Mutsha. I work with Stanbic Bank. I'm the head of corporate and investment banking as well as the executive director. I did social work for university. I did SWASA at Macquarie University. I was a loan officer for three and a half years. So I went to the Netherlands, did my MBA, and when I came back, I joined Citibank. Uh, three and a half years later, I joined Barclays. Then after that, I joined Stanbic as head of transactional products and services. And two years ago, I was promoted to head of corporate and investment bank. So 20 something years career, but very exciting. So I'm really excited about partnering with NSSF um, in the expo, the career expo. Uh, if you just finished your university, one thing I realized is that your initial degree doesn't actually matter. It's almost like, get it, tick that box. In banking, we've got, we've got a doctor, we've got lawyers, we've got uh, engineers, lots of engineers. So your first degree it doesn't define you. Uh, it can just be a stepping stone to the career that you want. The NSSF Career Expo gives you an opportunity to resources, to people, to experiences that are important for you as you look to plan and, 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 and implement your career goals. There's a link below that you can sign up and secure your place at that expo. I encourage you to sign up and to join us as we discuss all these great ideas and give you tips on what has worked for us and what has been uh, good for our careers. NSSF, a better life. Uh, my name is Sike Jaffith. I lead the team at Innovation Village which is Uganda's launchpad for leading entrepreneurs, creatives, and young people who are solving big, broken problems using technology. We've also most recently expanded into the creative space by building Motive, which is a playground for creatives in wood, fashion, metal, art, and uh, media and entertainment. What COVID has taught us is that nobody has all the answers. But as a young person, you suddenly realize that anyone can contribute to bring solutions to life. The question is simple, really. Um, if you're thinking about what career can I get into, you have to go back and say, what problems, big problems, problems that are affecting millions of people, do I care about? And how do I turn those problems into a business opportunity? I'm also very excited to be part of the NSSF Career Expo. We shall be discussing how you can repurpose your career in light of the new normal. And I encourage you to sign up, join the conversation, and be part of the change we want to see in this country. NSSF, a better life. My name is Sandra Twinobrio. I am a news anchor currently working with NTV Uganda. I am also an entrepreneur in fashion, youth guidance, and also digital marketing. Well, my career journey actually started when I was at school. You know, I, I initially wanted to be a lawyer, but when I saw I couldn't get into law school at that point, I decided to look at my best second option and that was journalism. I am excited, delighted and looking forward to being the moderator of this year's NSSF Career Expo uh, that focuses on guiding young people to make the right career choices. Moving ahead, they'll get out of university and they will have to think of what to do. This expo is the right avenue for them to talk to different practitioners in different industries, 
pick some ideas on what to do, when and how. But we have amazing guest speakers. Among these, we have CK Jaffif uh, from the Innovation Village. We also have Emma Mcha from Stanbic and Juliana Kagwa from UBL. I believe these are people that come with a wide range of knowledge and young people have to use this opportunity to exploit it to the maximum, to learn as much as possible. So please do follow the link and register for the NSSF Career Expo. You definitely didn't want to miss it. NSSF, a better life. Hello everybody, my name is Ron Kawamara. I'm CEO of Jumia Uganda. I'm very excited to participate in the NSSF Career Expo 21, which begins on March 24th to the 26th. Um, this year's theme is even more timely, that is repurposing your career goals for the new normal. I look forward to sharing with you and learning from you and learning with you. So please sign up at NSSF UG dot org forward slash career expo 21 see you then nssf a better life My name is Emma Mutsha. I work with Stanbic Bank. I'm the head of corporate and investment banking as well as the executive director. I did social work for university. I did SWASA at Macquarie University. I was a loan officer for three and a half years. So I went to the Netherlands, did my MBA, and when I came back, I joined Citibank. Uh, three and a half years later, I joined Barclays. Then after that, I joined Stanbic as head of transactional products and services. And two years ago, I was promoted to head of corporate and investment banking. So 20 something years career, but very exciting. So I'm really excited about partnering with NSSF um, in the expo, the career expo. Uh, if you just finished your university, one thing I realized is that your initial degree doesn't actually matter. It's almost like, get it, tick that box. In banking, we've got, we've got a doctor, we've got lawyers, we've got uh, engineers, lots of engineers. So your first degree it doesn't define you. Uh, it can just be a stepping stone to the career that you want. The NSSF Career Expo gives you an opportunity to resources, to people, to experiences that are important for you as you look to plan and, 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 and implement your career goals. There's a link below that you can sign up and secure your place at that expo. I encourage you to sign up and to join us as we discuss all these great ideas and give you tips on what has worked for us and what has been uh, good for our careers. NSSF, a better life.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very fast virtual, very fast of its kind, virtual NSSF Career Expo 2021. Welcome, welcome, 30 minutes later. But here we are, set to go, ready to learn and ready to interact. My name is Sandra Twinovio. I am a news anchor currently with working with NTV Uganda. I am also an entrepreneur in fashion, digital marketing, and youth guidance. I am also the founder of Unemployment Ends With Me Youth Initiative. Uh, now this initiative focuses on contributing to the fight against unemployment among the youth here in Uganda. Now today is a very special day, and uh, I believe it is a timely conversation that we are yet to have. But before I dive into the theme, uh, the, the nitty gritties of the conversation today, I want to take you back to the day NSSF launched its very first, you know, for the last nine years, we've seen NSSF organize career expos different from these. Initially, it would be in different universities speaking to, you, to students, but here we are going the virtual way because we know what has been happening. The COVID-19 pandemic that has changed the dynamics of how we operate. Now, for the last nine years, NSSF has been organizing career expos uh, since its inception in 2011. And uh, it has so far reached about uh, over 167,000 students, and uh, that's in about 12 universities all across uh, the country, and that is uh, per year. Now, the expo, what you should know as a person, a young person who's joining us for the very first time, or even you as a parent, for instance, if you're watching it on behalf of your child, you should know that this expo focuses on engaging students from different universities in discussions focusing on guiding and equipping our young people, the university students, with the skills and knowledge to improve their employ employment prospects as well as entrepreneurship for those that may choose to explore that aspect of life. So today we'll be talking about that and so much more. And our main theme this year is uh, the general theme. This is a three-day theme. And uh, it is our general theme is repurposing your career goals to the new normal. And it, is, it has been broken down into different sub-themes. I want to do that for you. As a student joining us, you should know that we are going to have amazing rewards on this, in this expo. So get your notebook ready, get your pen, like they say. When you write down something, it's very easy to remember it. So get your notebook, clear the environment so that your ears, every single thing that is around you is very attentive. So our general theme, this expo is repurposing your career goals to the new normal. And we've broken it down into three sub themes. Day one, which is today, we are going to be re, uh, focusing on purposing the new ideas and opportunities beyond the university degree. Day two, we'll be looking at matching your capabilities with the new changing world. And uh, finally, on the very last day, we are going to be asking you, talking about preparing you, preparing you really for the current versatile job markets. Now, our hashtag is uh, NSSF Expo 2021. So do get to our social media platforms and be part of the conversation. If you're on Zoom, you can also comment. You can do this here and there on our social media platforms. But first, follow the NSSF page, follow NMG, and uh, We'll be right there to look at your thoughts. Do remember when you comment, when you send anything, you use the hashtag NSSF Expo 2021. Now to our panelists today, before I introduce them, as, as your moderator today, I am excited to be interacting with all of you and the students that are watching us today, I'm equally eager to learn because I believe I'm still, I still have a lot of things to learn myself. But I know that two years ago, about two years ago, I was in the same position that many of the students are in. You're at campus, you're not sure where you're heading to. You're doing a certain course, but you're not sure if you're going to get the job immediately. So I know for those that are watching us today, you're in a place of, sometimes you're in a place of, you're not sure, I'm doing a bachelor's in education, but am I actually going to be a teacher? Or I am doing bachelor's in journalism, but am I going to get a placement in one of the media houses in the country? So the confusion that comes with competing for a job, I know how that feels. The, the uncertainty of 
being able to leave university and stay unemployed. I know how that feels and also because I've interacted with young people. This topic is a very timely theme and I believe that we are yet to learn. All I ask is uh, let us be as interactive as possible and you in the comment section also you can ask as many questions as you want. Like I mentioned, we have amazing rewards to be won and uh, later on we shall have a survey that you also need to fill. The beauty about filling a survey, I do not know, I haven't actually done a survey that guarantees me winning. But this time round, NSSF is saying that if you engage yourself in this survey at the end of every single session, you get to win yourself amazing prizes. So there you have it, you've come to learn and you're also going to win. So. Ladies and gentlemen, our very virtual career expo is about to, st to start officially. And allow me introduce our pa uh, panelists today. I want to start from my far left, um, Mr. John Senkezi, who is the digital supervisor, NSSF. You could give us a very brilliant smile. We could use that today. Uh, he manages the digital section with NSSF, and he has over 10 years experience in digital and uh, social media strategy. He's very passionate uh, about the growth of the digital industry in Uganda and uses his free time to transfer knowledge by training young people from different walks of life. I'll be coming to you for training. Thank you for joining us today. Um, closest to, uh, we are getting closer to my left. I'll move on to Milton, Mr. Milton Owol, who is the head of human resources and administration here at NSSF and uh, he was the regional HR director East and Southern Africa uh, for the British America Tobacco, among others. He is an expert in human resource. Now, if you're watching us today, you should know this is the man that will show you, that will tell you what is going to make you very employable in this versatile market that we're working in. Now, finally, my closest left by the welcome, Mr. Milton Owo, we're excited. Uh, we are looking forward to learning so much about what makes a young person very employable in, a, in a, an environment that is very competitive. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Ron uh, Kawamara. Now, I do not know about you, but every single day I receive messages from Jumia. I, I do not know if I'm the only one, but I want to believe that all of us have sort of seen Jumia somewhere. And today we speak to the CEO of Jumia Uganda, and he has been working with Jumia for over five years. He is skilled in startups, technology, marketing, business development, and management. So we are looking forward to understanding uh, what makes Jumia stand out in this very competitive market once again. So ladies and gentlemen, these are our panelists. If you're watching us, you're just joining us, we're excited, we welcome you to the very first virtual NSSF Career Expo. Ready to learn, get your notebooks ready, your pens ready. Remember, when you write it, you remember it. Now, to our panelists, first things first. The people watching us today have had over 10 years experience, over five years experience. The bigger question is, Wherever they are, they must be thinking, do these panelists actually understand what we are currently going through as young people? And I want us to take, I want each one of you to take us back to your university days, to the situation, to the experiences you are going through, to, to the thoughts you had at that point. What was going through your mind when you were at university? First, were you studying what you're doing now or things changed? I want to start with Mr. John Sinkezi. Over to you, take the floor. Um, thank you, Sandra. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think we, we, we have a fundamental situation we find ourselves in. Uh, on one hand, we have people who are doing the jobs of their dreams. We all had those dreams. I want to become a pilot. I want to become a lawyer. Uh, but as you grow up and try to interface with the world, you find that you will end up doing the job of your reality and not your dreams per se. So when I'm looking at a person who has drifted far away from what I studied at campus, I don't look very far. Um, one of the best case studies there is, I studied accounting and finance as my first course, and here I am doing digital marketing for the last 10 years. So. Um, 
maybe you could ask wha wha what was wrong with you then to go in for accounting. I come from a very uh, heavy accounting family. So perhaps, you know, I was indoctrinated into thinking accounting and finance quite easily. So I joined university. I was looking for the most complicated arts course there was, which I found accounting and finance to, d to be. But along the way, uh, in my first year, I joined television, WBS, uh, back in the days. And I was thrown into a totally new environment. So in the morning, because I was taking evening classes, in the morning I would be at WBS in the production department, writing scripts, uh, helping to produce adverts. And then in the afternoon or evening, I'm going into an accounting and finance class where I'm doing balance sheets, P&Ls, and, and all of that. So I found myself in a big dilemma which was uh, further heightened when I attended <coughs> a Google conference. Back then, we used to have what were called G-Uganda conferences. So Google would send a team of marketers, developers in Uganda uh, to kind of walk you around their ecosystem. So I attended one of those, uh, and the experience was life-changing for me. So here I was, an accounting and finance guy, doing uh, TV production for then the best TV station, and then I go into a tech world. So that was the turning point for me. Uh, it just complicated my situation. I was torn between completing my accounting and finance course, which I was morally obligated to complete on behalf of my parents, I would say. But then my passion, I realized later, lied elsewhere. So I took on a number of relevant courses, uh, a lot of self-learning, a lot of uh, certification, to kind of get to a place where I'm doing something that I love. So my balance sheets then started to stop balancing. It's a balance sheet, but it wasn't balancing. Because while I had to complete <coughs> my studies, on the other hand, I knew my passion lied elsewhere. But I did not stop at that. I completed my, 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 my studies. Uh, my trend was towards a first class. Because of the uh, change in mindset, I ended up going second lower, which is OK. But then as soon as we graduated, or even before graduation, I had started pursuing something that I believe I'm passionate about. So you know, digital is quite broad. We have strategists, we have content creators, we have uh, reporting and analytics people, we have media buyers, we have community managers. So although at the time I looked at uh, my accounting and finance paper as a waste of my time then, I realized that regardless of where you start, you have to pick up learnings in all these courses that you're doing. You could find that you're starting off with maybe media as, as your core focus. Along the way, you realize, oh, maybe I'm not a media person. I'm meant to be in marketing. You switch over to marketing. The key thing is, right from the start, pick a course that you feel adds value over and above the core profession that it offers. Because right now, um, as a digital marketer, I work a lot with budgets. I work a lot with uh, data from the platforms, apps, etc. So my accounting and finance uh, background helps me appreciate this better. But I'm also in a unique position that many people don't you know, find themselves in, where in spite of having started off at the wrong foot, I'm actually ending up doing something that I'm quite passionate about. So I think the key thing is first for someone to find that thing that they are really passionate about, because I've realized, and I'm not saying this because the head of HR is here, that apart from the bills I have to pay, digital marketing is something that I can do with no stress. I don't need supervision. I, need, I don't need to be pushed. And this is all because I wake up looking forward to the next big digital thing to happen. I want to create campaigns. I want to impact people. So I think the key thing for uh, the people out there is, first of all, find your passion. And even if you fight, because some guys are in second year or third year soon graduating, wherever you find it or whenever you find it, do not stop there because the paper is limiting you. It is actually an opportunity for you to have a springboard to what you really uh, want to be at the end of the day. Thank you so much, John. Uh, you mentioned a lot about uh, passion, and I'm sure you've had the discussion in different camps, really. Passion or money? What do you have to say about that? When someone is choosing a career path, what should they focus more on, passion or money? You have bills to pay. 
and then you have something that you love to do. So what do you choose? I think the key is to focus on that passion that you have that you can monetize. It needs to be something you love doing, but at the end of the day, it needs to be something that will help you generate an income and pay some bills. And there are so many examples that we see. Like if you go to the creative uh, world, we, we have producers, we have filmmakers. They love, love, love maybe storytelling, they love graphics, etc. But then the skill is in demand. So I think the, it starts from identifying a problem for which your uh, passion you know, provides a solution. Because if there is a need for whatever your passion is bringing on the table, people are willing to pay for it at the end of the day. The risk is in picking on something because you're just passionate about it and no one is, is, is demanding for such a skill of s or, or such a passion, and then you take that direction. So I think we, you don't have to choose between money. Uh, and then the more you practice your passion, the more you realize that uh, the money that you're getting from whatever you're doing is also substantially increasing because you're able to deliver cutting edge results uh, over and above what you know the market is offering. So I think concentrate on a passion that is in demand. People have problems that your passion can uh, solve. Focus on that, monetize your passion, and you know, the sky is the limit. All right, thank you so much, John. Uh, over to you, our students who are watching us today. That is John Senkazi's story. What is your story? And what are some of the questions that you think John needs to, to uh, actually respond to? He mentions that he had to switch it up, to switch career paths, you know, from one aspect to another, and it was a bit hard at some point and difficult. And maybe you're in that position as well, and you need some clarity on how to move ahead. John will be able to give you that response. Note it down, passion or money. I've seen young people talk about it a lot. So send in your questions on our social media platforms. Do remember, the hashtag is NSSF Expo 2021. Twitter, Facebook, Zoom, everywhere we are there, and we'll get you there. Now, over to you, Milton O'War, who is the head of human resources and administration here at NSSF. I, I, should I say, taking you back to 10, 15, five years ago, whichever, eh? did you think at this point in 2021, you'll be dealing with different NSSF employees every day, thinking about um, what they need to do, thinking about their welfare as the human resource uh, manager at this point in time? Taking you back to university, did you think you would be in this place? And what was your experience back there? OK, I don't know. I don't know if this is clear. Is it good? All right. Thank you. Uh, you've taken me back very many years ago to my university days. I won't say how many years. But let me just say that uh, at the time when I was doing university, the world of work was significantly different from the world of work today. Over the last uh, five, seven years, we have seen such a rapid change in the way work is done, how work is done, where it's done, and what's work itself. So significantly different, I think, is what I can say. If I'm addressing myself to the students who are at campus now, whether first year, second, or third year, I think I would say two things for you. The first one is, uh, count yourself lucky to be at university, to have the opportunity to get that first degree. But less than 20 or 30% of you will actually do what... The world of work is changing so rapidly. We know what technology is, is doing. We know what COVID has done to the world. So there is such rapid automation happening. There is such rapid uh, uh, artificial intelligence data ro robotics and all that that's happening in the world. So two things that I would say people need to do when you're at campus. For one, focus on getting the best degree that you can get. Whether that's the job you're going to do in your life or not, that doesn't matter. But focus on getting that first degree the best you can. Once you've finished it, and John did a good job of it, in terms of determining what your passion is, you know, we have two types of people in the world. There are people who get into the world and let the world blow them to whatever direction the wind is going. And then there's another set of people who determine where, where they want to go 
and do everything to focus them towards going to that direction. I think we all know that the people who tend to succeed most in life, whether it's in employment or in private practice, tend to be the category of people who have clarity of where they want to go. And then everything they do is focused on getting them there. I know many people love football. If you're playing football and you don't know where your goal post is, where you want to score, chances are that you'll be kicking the ball in either direction, whichever direction, yeah? So while you're kicking your ball in all directions, your colleagues who are focused on where the ball should be going are likely to be hitting their life's goals much better than you. So the first thing is get the best degree that you can. Second, be clear on your passion. And some people struggle, by the way. I know people who work for five years, six years, ten years even, and when you ask them what their purpose, what their, what their passion is, they still struggle with it. So if you're not clear, don't shy from asking for help. Talk to people. The world is full of good people who want to support you to succeed. Please talk to people. They will help you to find your purpose. And once you find your purpose, two things you do about it. Develop skills that help you to get to that purpose. If you want to learn, there's a thousand and one things that we can all learn. But you've got to be selective in what you're learning. Okay? You have to learn things which help you go towards your purpose. And I, I encourage young people who come to work at NSSF to be clear what they want and take advantage of the more senior or the more experienced people who have been there, they have done that, they have lots of experience and knowledge that they can share with you. Those guys will help you identify what are the gaps that you need to bridge to be able to get to where you want to get. And once you know those gaps, I tell you, many people, especially at the workplace, but I saw it in students as well, when somebody tells you aim for a first class like John was or aim for something so much high, the natural human instinct is to shy away to say, but that's so high, you know, or if you are starting a, a job at NSSF and your passion is to be an MD and you're way down, you know, people shy away from dreaming big. Because you say, how am I a low-level employee ever going to be a Richard Vyarugaba? I tell you, that's the wrong attitude, which as a student you want to address from day one. What helps me and helps a lot of people that I get privileged to mentor and coach is there is this adage of a journey of a thousand miles starts with what? With one step. If you know that to be that aspiration of yours requires you to fill a gap as big as this. Just commit yourself to say, that skill takes me so long to fill, but I'll want to work on, even if it's 0.5%, I'll fix 0.5% of it every single week. All right? And you have the discipline enough to say, I'll do 0.5 or 1% every single week. All right? In one year, what percent have you covered? There are 52 weeks in a year, right? So in one year, you're 52% covered the gap. In two years, how far have you gone? So my key thing for you as students is, A, focus on being the best that you can be while you're still at campus. Don't worry too much what you're reading, but be the best you can be at it. Second, as early as possible, know where your goalposts are. Don't come out and shoot your balls in all directions. Know which direction your where you can score, and then identify what gaps you need to be able to get you there, and do one step at a time. If you're disciplined enough and consistent enough, you are sure you'll get there. Thank you so much, Milton. Our, uh, consistency is very key, and knowing your goalposts uh, also is very important, so that you don't move all over the place. But I still want to to understand, just to give the, our young people watching us today, just a little personal experience, again, taking you back, what is that one struggle that you had while at campus in regards to finding your goalpost? Okay, when I was at campus, and I think like many people who would be listening to us, I initially thought my priorities were, you know, when you come from a boys' school all your life, all of a sudden you go to campus and it's a different environment, the temptation to fall into 
the fun of campus tends to be a lot higher. And as a young person, it takes a lot of discipline to draw the line between when to have fun and when to, to do serious stuff. So I had a lot of that. Uh, I had a lot of that struggle. And then uh, during our time, we didn't have too much luxury of uh, well we had, but you had to be a super good student. So we didn't choose too much what you go to study at campus. You go do your Essex, the results come out, then McKinley decides to invite you for whatever degree they think you're good at. So I got invited to a degree, which I did. It didn't have a very direct connection to human resources uh, and administration management, but I did it anyway. So then uh, the time finishes. Uh, my first job was with British American Tobacco way back then, and BAT was looking for graduate trainees. So they came to campus and they asked for a few students, so we got interviewed. I was lucky to be given a job in BAT. And they decided to make me a management trainee in human resources department. So I go into HR, and um, I can tell you my aspiration was to do something totally different from HR. But then jobs are hard to get. BAT was a big name way back then. I called myself lucky, so they have made me graduate training in HR. They pay well, they look after people well. So I decided, well, why don't I give it the best shot that I can? And then um, I gave it everything I had, and they gave me everything they had as well. And over time, I discovered that doing HR is actually fun. I like to deal with different people. You know, we, have, we had 500, 600 people different issues, different challenges. I like developing people to see them grow. That gave me the opportunity to do that. I like to be able to shape the environment where people work so that there's, everybody has a fair chance to be the best version of themselves. That gave me the opportunity of that. And I think somebody along the line noticed it, and I was lucky to get fairly rapid promotions in BAT, including uh, you know, work in different parts of the country. And I fell in love with HR. So I think my story, uh, moderator, if I can say, is if you throw yourself into something and give it the best that you can, usually you develop a passion for it and you feel rewarded for it. So in other words, a person can grow to love what they're doing. Absolutely. It's like the same thing uh, if you hear, if you hear uh, these relationship counselors they say you, you meet a young lady or you meet a lady. Initially, what you see in her is a beautiful face, a beautiful figure, whatever. The more you get to know one another, the more you get to relate, it's very likely that you get to appreciate the inner. I'm sure that is an example very many can relate with. <laughs> you get to appreciate the inner beauty of the person. And where there was uh, something different from love, actually love grows. And that love can end up being much stronger than uh, people who start with the real love. So it's possible if you get into it, give it your best, and they give you back their best. You can, I think you can find or you can create success in anything that you truly love and apply yourself to. All right. I thank you so much, Milton O'War, uh, for sharing with us your experience. Discipline, consistency are key things that we as young people need in order to move ahead. Now moving on to Ron Kawamara, who is the CEO of Jumia Uganda. We are curious to hear your story back at campus. Did you think three, uh, should I say, about five years, <laughs> many years ago, <laughs> you'll be right here turning the uh, Uganda upside down with uh, Jumia border borders here and there, delivering things here and making people shop crazy online. No, uh, I think like uh, the previous two speakers, uh, my story was different at the university. Um, I was sure when I started my year one that I wanted to go to finish my social sciences degree and then go to law school. Uh, where I did my degree to go to law school, you had to first finish your undergrad and then get into a law school for four years and then uh, go, on, go on to become a lawyer. But then as soon as I started, uh, I realized law was not for me. And uh, 
so I decided to do several degrees. In fact, in my undergrad, I ended up doing three undergraduate degrees because I didn't know what to do. I, my first degree was in political science. I added another one in behavioral science, and I decided that behavioral science was not important. I decided to do development economics, so I felt at least economics would get you somewhere. When I graduated, um, jobs were not uh, easy to find. Now, this was at the height of the recession that happened uh, several years back when, when Bush was president and things were not good. Um, I didn't get a job, so I decided to take an internship, unpaid internship. Uh, and I worked for several companies for free. I, I was putting my own transport, um, working without having a clear direction of where I wanted to go. But uh, because at the time I was uh, staying in, in a place that was very entrepreneurial, I was learning and looking at young people starting new things. So I didn't have the money to, to start a business, um, but I had done very well in my university, so uh, I, I got a scholarship to do my master's. So I went, uh, I did my master's degree, um, and then I was sure uh, of two things. One is that I wanted to come back to Uganda, but I didn't know what to do in Uganda. Um, so then the second part is that I needed a job, and I applied everywhere. Uh, one of the jobs I got was a, as a graduate trainee uh, job at the UN, and I was very excited. But the job was not bringing me back to Uganda, so I decided to, to, to let that job go. And, and come back to Uganda. Um, but uh, there was no jobs in Uganda, so I decided that why not start something for myself? Um, and I had seen uh, in several places um, the food industry was doing very well and was doing very well because the restaurants could increase the, their sales by offering delivery. And so I figured Uganda was ready for online business. Um, so in 2013, I decided to start a business called uh, Hello Food. I'm not sure if people uh, remember what Hello Food was, which later became uh, Junior Food. And I didn't have the money to, to, to do it. But one thing about technology is that uh, technology is a great equalizer. That uh, technology allows, if you have a good idea, you don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire to be able to, to get it started. And because I had an idea where I felt that we could add value to restaurants by providing an additional incremental sales channel for them, that we could make it, make it work. And so I had met my colleagues I'd started with, and we managed to fundraise and put together some money. So we started. And, and we made so many mistakes because we were young and we were excited. At first I, I, I thought that I would just do a website and put uh, menus there and, and, and customers will come and place an order and, and, and uh, restaurants will be able to deliver food on their own. Well I quickly realized that uh, Uganda is a very mobile driven country that people did not access the internet on their laptops or their computers so the website I built was useless. So I went back to the drawing board and now I had to develop an app because people were accessing internet via the mobile phone. So I had to build an app that could be on, on, uh, on their phones. Now, mind you, this was the time where there was no online business. There was no Uber, there was no Safe Border, there was no Dreamia. We were just um, not uh, something we were doing. So we built the app and uh, and we thought we'd get customers, and people did come, and few people tried it. Then we realized many of the restaurants did not have the ability to even package the food. Some of them didn't have packaging materials, they didn't have motorcycles to deliver the food. So now, I had to import packaging materials for the restaurants. I had to work out uh, a delivery solution, get motorcycles, brand them, bring uh, holding materials, uh, warmers, things that can hold the food uh, to be able to offer this, this solution. Um, and then also we realize that for restaurants, it's very difficult for them to convince them 
that uh, they can make money doing delivery and still pay you a commission, still pay you 20, 25% commission. I found out that uh, many of the restaurants were making up menu prices. That the reason that somebody would price a plate of chicken and chips this way they did is because the guy next door was pricing their food at 10,000, so they would price theirs at 8,000. And you have a whole city that has no science about how they price their food. And it was very difficult to convince somebody who doesn't know how their prices have come to be to give you a commission. So we moved from being a, a company that offers a platform that delivers food to customers to now educating the restaurants how to value, to, to price the menus. How do you look at your overheads? How do you put in your uh, cost uh, of, of personnel and all these things and ingredients? How, how then should be the price be on the menu? And over time, and this was uh, me with my laptop going restaurant to restaurant and, and, and educating the people. Um, and then, of course, we have the challenges we all know about uh, addresses. Most people cannot place themselves on the address grid. And so we had to develop a tool that allowed our drivers to be able to find customers. And once they find a customer, they can ping it on the GPS. So next time, another driver can be able to remember where this customer is. So now then we moved from being you know, not just a platform, but also logistics provider, then importing of, um, importing of packaging materials, and so on and so on. But slowly it, it picked up, uh, and then we saw that Ugandans were ready for online business, for, for technology. Uh, and so since then, of course, uh, we became Jumia Food, and we have grown. And it took many lessons out of that, is that uh, the time that I was at university and not sure what to do, the time when I graduated uh, and didn't have a job, but I decided to, um, to go and do internships, I was building myself, I was building some sort of skills that did help me when I was ready to start a business, for example. The graduate degree that I did, whereas I do not use directly the hard skills I acquired in classroom, the network it provided for me did help me when I was ready um, to, do, to do a business. Uh, and so, and, and up today, uh, I can benefit from that. So for me, um, I guess the lesson here is, is that uh, at university, even after university, things might not be very clear. That you might not be sure what you want to do, the job might not be there. But in the meantime, what are you doing? Are you growing your skill set? And by skill set, I don't mean the hard uh, stuff you get in the classroom. Everyone has that. Everyone will graduate with a degree, which certifies that you have a degree in, in economics, you have a degree in political science, you have a degree in accounting, and many people will have that. I think what makes people stand out, what will make a difference for you is the soft skills. Those are things that um, are not very easy to teach in the classroom. Those are things that uh, you gain by applying yourself. What is that? Leadership skills, uh, problem solving skills. Um, that is critical thinking. That is analyt analytics, being able to analyze problems. And, and you get this by applying yourself. You get this by challenging yourself. And for me, it was taking on many internships that were not paying me but I was learning from people who were doing things at that level, who were starting new businesses. Um, and over time, uh, this is who you become. Uh, you become the people you hang with, you become the people you, you learn from, you become the interns, internships that you, you, you take on. And more importantly, it builds a network for you that you can call on when you need that network. And so a lot of people uh, who are at university or even recent graduates there's a sense of resignation that we have. There's, that, uh, there's, there's no jobs, um, and uh, there's nobody willing to give me an opportunity. But if you want to work for NSSF, or you want to work for other big organizations, have you reached out? Have you reached out to see if they have unpaid internships? Have you reached out to see if they have mentorship programs that you can be part of? And so when you apply yourself, you'll be hitting several birds with one stone, and that is learning and growing your skill set and growing your network. 
All right, thank you. Like they say, your network is your net worth. Very well said, Ron Kawamara. And you point out, uh, a po you bring out an aspect that I believe either some of us or all of us, even the people that are watching us today, s have sort of a went through, have gone through it. You do, I do not know if you've interacted with young people that have told you, oh, I was doing internship and the only thing I was getting was their coffee. Yeah, and they are so bothered by that. Or you meet young people that will say, the only thing I was getting at my internship was that Katenke for transport. But I want to bring it back to you. Speak to us about, since you went through a number of internships that were unpaid, and there are students right now that are either looking for internship placements or they, they are already in, in some that are not paid for and they are thinking of quitting. What can you say to them? Well, I think um, the most important thing to remember is don't do nothing. I think whatever situation you're in, and it's not just about employment, is uh, don't do nothing, do something. And, and, and so it's, it's very difficult, of course, um, when somebody does not have enough resources to have an apartment in Kampala, to have a place to stay. It's a challenge to, to tell that person that it's worth it to, to do an unpaid internship. I understand that. But I think what's worse is to do nothing. Because at the end of the day, um, the one thing that you have is yourself. It's not even the degree that you did. When I look at when I'm hiring uh, for our team, uh, we don't really look at the degree you did. We look at the individual. We look at what do you bring. Do you have the same values we have? And the values uh, are going to be those things that, are, that I mentioned. Do you have that zeal and, and that bias for executions of getting things done, of, of, of problem solving? And so essentially, by not doing something, by not working even when it's not paid, you're making yourself um, more and more irrelevant. Uh, because we are in a competition uh, as a country, we're in a competition uh, among companies, we're in a competition as individuals, there's competition. Whether you see it or not, there's a competition. And the reality is that uh, the people and companies and countries are always improving. And for me, if you are not improving as an individual, it means that you're gradually sinking. You're making it very difficult to have a starting point. And for me, the point is find a starting point. And many times, because of the nature of the job market today, um, the pandemic, the COVID-19, has really changed company and consumer behavior in ways that has had an impact on what companies look for going forward. And so, and, and what they are looking for now is going to be those skills that you cannot get through automation, those skills that you cannot get by outsourcing to India, and those are the soft skills. So, uh, and so how do you get those soft skills if you've never had a job? Is internships, is uh, getting mentorships. Uh, and so uh, it's building resilience, even if you have a job, even if you have a job, or you have an entry-level job uh, or a mid-level job, the reality is that things are changing. We have not really experienced the full impact of COVID-19. So we need to make sure that whoever you are, whether you're a recent graduate or a, a young student, or you are an entry-level job or mid-level job, is building resilience in yourself, right. uh, or resilience in your business as well. All right, uh, thank you so much, Ron. Now, before I, I say something to the students watching us today, I do want to throw our sub-theme today to our panelists today. Propo purposing new ideas and opportunities beyond the university degree is a relative, relatively new concept. So I would like you to be thinking about it so that you help us understand why is it that today we are talking about purposing new ideas and opportunities beyond the university degree at this point in time. To our students joining us on our social media platforms, do remember the hashtag is NSSF Expo 2021. And we'll be going all the way for the next uh, one hour, I think, as we carry on with this discussion. But we want to hear from you and not only 
hear from you. We also want you to know that you have some prizes, amazing prizes to win. And uh, later we'll be letting you know what these are. But the, here's the very first question that will guarantee that you get yourself a prize. You've seen we have three days to go, two days to go. We ask you today to let us know in our comment section who are the next two speakers tomorrow. Name any two speakers for day two and day three. Do remember when you comment, you put the hashtag NSSF Expo 2021 and we'll be right there to pick you. So that's our very first quiz. We're waiting to give you all these amazing prizes. Remember to note down and learn as much as possible and exploit this day as much as you can. I do want to to start with the uh, Milton Award, and I'm just throwing this sub theme to you. When you hear purposing new ideas and opportunities beyond the university degree, what comes to mind? Someone watching us today, what do you think that really means to them? Thank you. Uh, purposing new ideas beyond the degree, I think speaks to a lot of what we just said as we began because the degree happens to be only the starting point. If we know that the world of work has changed or is changing so very rapidly, it almost goes without saying that the majority of people, the degrees that they are doing now, it's unlikely to be what your life's, what your life's uh, uh, career is going to be. So I guess what we are looking at today in the theme of today is to challenge the minds of our young students, as, as indeed we challenge the minds of even people who are not young students who are already in employment, is how do you tap into your knowledge, your skills, to tap into new opportunities that are opening up? Because the world of as it is, and I think he articulated it very well, with the advancement of technology, with the huge impact of, of COVID, the kind of jobs that exist today are not going to be the same jobs that exist tomorrow. I've got some numbers from the WTO conference of 2020, which says as of um, 2020, technology, i.e. machines, are doing 33% of the work that exists. The rest is being done by humans. By 2025, that number would have changed to 63% done by technology. That's machines, robotics, artificial intelligence, and all that. That's a huge move in only five years. One would be scared to think, what about 2030? What will that number be? So clearly, for us to remain relevant, for us to remain productive, we have to rethink the skills that we need to develop. And those, like you said, will be on the soft side, on the soft skills. What are those things that technology can't do that you mm. can do? Secondly, what, is, what are those skills you require to, to enable organizations leverage technology better? And that's where we talk about data scientists, data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. That's the future of the work. So for the students who are listening to us now, you might be doing a BA in social sciences, you might be doing accounting, you might be doing, know it, that inside the next five years, technology will be able to do your accounting much better than you, the human being, can do. So if you know that, what are you doing now to make yourself continue to be competitive and relevant in the times ahead? And that's where we talk about new opportunities, that's where we talk about new skills. And while we are at it, one of the things which I think the young graduates need to know early in their lives is whatever new opportunity you come up with or whatever new opportunities that comes at you, there are certain soft skills that are critical for your success. The first one, the first one is your social skills learning how to work with people. A lot of people in institutions, even those who start up their small businesses, a lot of them hit very bad roadblocks because of inability to work well with others. Working well with others is about giving and taking. There is something I hate people call, uh, I hate that people call organization politics. People call it 
you know, fighting your way up the ladder. People try to pull down others so that they can go up. That's the worst thing you can do for yourself because you create negative energy about yourself. The more you give of, of yourself, the more people give into you. The more you push people away, the more people push you away as well. That's one thing. The second one, which people need to know really early in their career is the element of building trust around you. Something I normally call building your personal brand. If people see you walking through the door, people who know you, what comes immediately into their mind? Do they see somebody they can trust and work with? Do they see somebody they should watch out for? Do they see somebody who speaks what they mean, who delivers on their commitment? What sort of person do you want to be? You know, the key thing about human nature is that if people trust you, it's more likely they will take a chance at you. And the whole thing about opportunities is people accepting to give you a chance to take a chance with you. Create, make it easy for people to fail it easy to work with you. So it's about creating opportunities and having those skills, those soft skills. And I think the last one, just before I hand, I know time is not for us. There is this old-fashioned thing called hard work that many of our young people these days tend to put on the backside. I can tell you for sure, with all the best social skills we talked about, you know, knowing how to work well with people, knowing how to build your networks, knowing how to create a good personal brand around yourself, you better have the energy to do your work well. There's nobody who is going to spend a lot of their time with you if they can't trust that you give the best of yourself at what you do. It's too easy. We've had it over and over again, but people don't seem to appreciate it. Good is not good enough. Remember, all of us in this room are good at what we are doing. The differentiator between you and me or between a good person and a better person is that the other person goes beyond the normal expected. All right, uh, uh, Mr. HR, <laughs> I am I'm sorry to cut you no, short. Fine, I would please. like to move on to John. What does today's sub theme mean to you? I think I could uh, sum it up in uh, two ways. One, on, on one hand, you know, the, the career trajectory many people take will, will take on a T shape. You're either going to grow vertically. You've, you know, you've entered that entry level, you're becoming a manager, a, a, you know, a CMO, then AMD and stuff like that. But in light of the recent events, you find that uh, career growth is going to be more horizontal than it is vertical. So that calls for someone to upskill over and above that which they are studying at the university. And that starts with identifying what skills are needed in the current environment. And like the previous speakers say, um, a lot of it is driven by technology. Uh, a lot of it is driven by innovation. And some of these other things you can learn, others you need to build over time, which calls for you know practice and stuff like that. But there is also a new concept that is not new, but it has been really accelerated, and that's distributed workforces. That it's, it's becoming more real than it was in the past. We know companies like Andela have had it for a long time, but companies now are embracing technology for remote uh, working for, for different environments. <coughs> but they are also substantially decreasing the number of people that they have under their employment. So. That leads to uh, a scenario where you either have to um, upskill and grow vertically, in which case you become relevant beyond your core area of speciality. Alternatively, <coughs> and cyberspace has enabled this, is you have to start thinking about entrepreneurship. Because I think we were faced with a very tricky situation as far as the job market is concerned and the availability of jobs before COVID. Now with COVID, the situation has even got worse because even the ones in employment are being retrenched. They're cutting down numbers to you know, bring down the costs. So as a young person out there, I think we need to think beyond NSSF. I know it sounds a bit selfish, me being in NSSF and telling you not to think about it. You can maintain that aspiration of working for the big organizations, the NSSFs of this world, 
But on the other hand, you need to have an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, because you see, technology, like Ron said, is, is an equalizer. Before, for you to reach a certain customer base, you must, you, you, you must have had a huge budget, either TV or out of home or radio. Now with uh, social media, with, with other digital technologies, the same people that MTN, Airtel, or any company are talking to are the same guys you can reach at, at, at a fraction of the cost that was existing. So that creates a new marketplace for someone to come up with a solution or a product or service that can be you know, consumed in the market. And the route to market now is becoming more affordable, it's becoming leaner, it's becoming more personal. You can create a business on WhatsApp only, you can have a presence on Facebook, you can have uh, an e-commerce platform, and yes, it will be a painful journey, but it liberates you from the frustration that is bound to happen. Because at the end of the day, we need to face the reality. The numbers that are getting out from the universities as graduates are, are way more than the jobs that are being added on the grid. So someone needs to think outside the box and uh, think about alternative income streams. And if these income streams could be from things that you are passionate about, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. But even those that will end up working for these organizations, you need to have a back, at the back of your mind, you need to think as an entrepreneur. Think about your current employer as your own business, because then you will worry when they're making a loss, you will worry when your time is not being utilized well, because if it was your business, you wouldn't be happy with that. So even from uh, a soft skills point of view, you need to start thinking like an entrepreneur, even if you're working for a big organization. And where possible, start your business. All right. Uh, thank you so much, John. And uh, for our next quiz, do remember those watching us today, we are giving away prizes to 100 people today. That's how generous we are, by the way. So 100 people will walk away with prizes every single day. John, you'll be, you've been... I've, I've selected you <laughs> to choose the next quiz question that will allow our students to actually uh, win something at the end of the day. So think about it as we hear the thoughts of Ron, and then when we get back, you give us your quiz question in regards to today's theme. We want to understand if they actually understand uh, or they comprehend what we are talking about today. All right, over to you, Ron. What does uh, today's uh, sub-theme mean to you? Well, I think... In the past, disruption has been caused by technology, has been caused by maybe trade links like uh, globalization. Today, disruption has been forced on us by COVID. And, and uh, this means that the nature of work has changed and the nature of the needs of employers has changed. Um, and what employers are looking for is impact. And so for me, uh, what does the theme mean? How do you refocus your career goals? Is that you refocus your career goals to creating impact in whatever you want to do? I think the head of HR here at NSF is a good example. Clearly, you can see that it's not the degree that will make the difference. It's your ability to show that you can create, you can create impact. And you can't create impact by just being uh, an, an employee, just feeling the numbers. You create impact by having the right uh, tools in the arsenal. And to be able to do that, you have to do work on yourself. You have to do work on yourself. I was taking some notes here um, in terms of what I felt um, were practical things that uh, young people, uh, recent graduates, need to, to, to imagine what this new world looks like. Today, as we speak, uh, big companies, in fact, about 60% of Google's workforce, um, or what you call uh, independent contractors, short-term contractors, Many companies are realizing, number one, is that uh, they don't need to have uh, a lot of full-time employees. They are realizing that they don't need to have 
um, people in their offices. Um, what does that mean? It means that now, uh, if you are a young person, you need to make sure you have, you are an entrepreneur. Because to be an independent contractor means that you have to be able to offer things as a business almost. You're working with several gigs. Uh, you're working with uh, several companies on several projects. You have to run and you have a mindset and run yourself almost like an entrepreneur, like a business. You have to brand yourself like one. You have to have the right online presence and, 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 and be able to sell the services that, that you, you have. And then, uh, uh, most importantly, even if you're going to um, uh, an employment kind of environment, uh, I'll give you an example. Right now at Dreamia, out of the 450 employees we have, only about 150 are coming to office. And those are people maybe who are op operators in the warehouse who are managing the products that are moving in and out, but the rest of the staff is working from home. So they too need to make sure that if you're working from home, uh, for in, anybody who are hiring today needs to have the right communication skills because we're no longer in the same place. Has to have the right uh, way to be able to self-manage and self-motivate. And so today, I I'll say this very clearly that uh, if you are looking to get into employment and you don't have good communication skills, this new world will be very difficult for you. If you are looking to get an employment space and you don't have good data analysis, that you don't a good problem solver, um, that uh, you're not uh, uh, an executioner, this new workplace will be very difficult because this new environment now is looking for impact. And you cannot do that impact unless you have those soft skills that we keep mentioning, the soft skills, and these are things that Unfortunately, our universities and our high schools in Uganda are not teaching. So we need to make sure that you as an individual are seeking this out. You are taking your time out to make sure you're finding the right mentors, you're finding the right internships. You are going online to find the, these courses and, 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 and lessons. There's plenty of free courses you can find today on Udemy. You can find them on YouTube. You can find them in, on Coursera. You can find them on several free platforms. In, in fact, many universities have opened up their classes uh, on different skill sets available for free since COVID-19 hit. Even Harvard has made available many of their courses. So learning is more accessible and easier than ever. So it's, it's imperative that uh, young people, we are improving ourselves for this new job market, for this new context, because the reality of COVID-19 it has not totally changed the trajectory of the workforce. It has just accelerated what was already underway, that already companies were automating, already companies were working remotely, already e-commerce and tech was already growing, but it has accelerated that process. So we also need to accelerate our, our learning curve to be able to keep up with the new trends. All right. Thank you so much, Ron. I want to believe that, uh, John, you are ready with our second question that will rise. And among these, if you're wondering what kind of prizes we are going to have for you, we'll have uh, jumpers for you. It's the cold season, so you definitely need a jumper. We'll also have some Jumia vouchers. You see, we have the CEO over here, so you get to to shop as much as you want. We'll give you some Jumia vouchers and free data. Yes, free data, my files. You definitely have those as well. We are in an era where we have to use our online platforms or to log in and study and see this, all that. So all these presents are going to be yours. Do remember to use the hashtag uh, NSSF Expo 2021 and also send us your questions. What are some of the submissions that they have given us that you would like to be either further explained or if there is one thing that is confusing you as a young person at school and you're still trying to understand where do I go from here? How do I continue doing this internship? Should I leave and get into another one? These are the right people that will be speaking to you. And later I'll be asking, posing a question to our panelists on what makes you stand out. They've pointed it out, but because we have the head of HR here who has, who has an experience in that, would like to give you some tips on how you can really stand up out once you're in front of an employer. Over to you, John. 
what is our next quiz? Do I get a chance to win that or not? <laughs> all right, so I think we can all agree that uh, the power of your networks is, is very important, regardless of the level of, of your employment, whether entry level or you know graduation or something. So uh, in light of COVID-19, we can't have the traditional way we used to network at events and, and all of that. So what is the leading professional network platform that uh, the viewers out there can leverage and uh, you know just list tell us what's what's the leading professional networking platform uh, that is available to us today could you please say that again what is the leading professional networking platform that is available to you and I today all right. Thank you so much, John. I'm noting it down just to make sure I let the students joining us later to know that for you to win one of the prizes, remember we're giving out 100 prizes today to our students that have logged in, trying to, uh, to learn more from our panelists, picking thoughts here and there. We ask you today, the first quiz, we asked that you share with us the names of the two of two speakers for the day two and day three. We are waiting to see those responses. Do know if you're the first, you also get something. If you say the right answer, you get something. So today, everyone is a winner. The second question today that will guarantee that you win something, we ask you, what is the leading professional networking platform for us today? Your, net, your network is your net worth, absolutely. So now, m coming back to you, and briefly, I'll give you probably a minute each. We are wondering if you look from if you look at your own stories. Most students usually take on courses their second choices, third, fourth. It's usually not the first. If you're to really do a survey, do you think this is contributing to the high rates of unemployment in the country? I want to start with you, Ron. Well, um, I'm with the view that young people um, should, from a very young age. Um, have an opportunity to critically think. Um, rather than teaching and forcing students into streams that they may not uh, fit their interest, uh, fit their, what they're good at, is that we need to teach them how to critically think, how to analyze. And when students are trained how to think, they will choose the right pathway for themselves. And so I, I, am, uh, I don't believe that the system we have in Uganda works for students, it doesn't work for the country either. But having said that, uh, university is not there to just train, uh, uh, you know, and indoctrinate people. University is, is a time whereby you open your mind and you mature so you can take up uh, life by the horns and in your own hands. And so that's where w young people still have an opportunity to be able to make life what they want to make it. I think the example we've had today is of people who are doing something entirely different from what they studied. Uh, and so now that we know that yes, employment is difficult, now that we know that yes, many people did not select their courses by choice, but you have many other choices in life that you can take. And these choices are not just, you don't just decide I'm gonna be this or I'm gonna, you know, get into this employment, I'm going to start this business. You have to work towards it. So uh, I think what we need to do now is to, um, is to see ourselves as masters of our own destiny, and, and, and which means that you take chances, you take risks, um, is that when you're still young, I mean, what, what's there to lose, right? What's there to lose? Uh, the, for example, if you don't have employment, then maybe it's good to create a business because what's there to lose? Uh, you know, um, if you're not getting a job in a field you studied, what's there to lose then? Prepare yourself to move to another field. And that will mean that you, you find an entry point, maybe an internship, maybe some sort of mentorship. So it's about taking chances. And I'm, I'm telling you that from my experience, the people who I've seen succeed whether in employment, whether in starting a business, are people who took a chance, who took a great chance and were willing to risk and lose it all. So we also need to make sure that we're, we're taking risks and real risks. You know, I saw this statistic about that made Ugandans uh, or Uganda the most entrepreneurial country. On the face value, it's nice, but if you delve deeper, then you find, yes, we're creating a lot of businesses, but 
it's the same kind of business. If you go to a market and you look at everyone is selling the same fruits, there's no differentiation of products. And you look at people who are starting up these fashion shops uh, or boutiques, they're selling the same products everywhere. And so what does that mean? It limits how far you can go. If you're doing exactly what everyone is doing, is that means you're not taking a risk, but you realize that you know, mobile money is making money. Mobile money shops have made money, so let me start my own mobile money kiosk. Let me start my own boutique because my friend has a boutique. Let me also have my own stand selling fruits and vegetables in the market because everyone is doing it. No. Risk means risk. Means risk means that you're doing something that no one has done, that you think you, you can create an impact with your idea. So you it, it does not ideally matter. So yes, so when I see that Uganda is a very entrepreneurial country, it's great. But we need to add risk, a risk component to that, not just creating businesses because everyone else is doing it. So it doesn't matter if you, you opted for your third choice. You just have now to think of taking risks yes. and adding value to yourself and falling in love with what you do on a daily. Great impact, yes. Great. Over to you, Milton Owar. Uh, for a person that is constantly dealing with people coming in and out, I'm sure some days you employ, other days you suck. Yes. What do you think is the major contributor to unemployed graduates currently? Is it the fact that sometimes they opt for their third, fourth choices and they don't go for their initial um, choice that they wanted to take on? Thank you. I think uh, one of the biggest uh, reasons for unemployment in our country now is uh, a lot of our young people are finishing universities when they still have the mindset that when you finish university the logical thing is to walk into a job. That used to be the case very many years ago when you walk out of a university with your degree paper you get a job. But like we've said consistently the world has been changing a lot. The number of uh, university graduates who walk into a job in my estimation would be 20 percent or less which brings us to the theme of today what other things can you do with yourself? Now, I think the reason why you have a lot of people feeling stuck, so to speak, is uh, a, the lack of imagination and creativity to decide what it is that you want to do and the courage to get on with it. And secondly, people talk a lot of the young people that I talk to, tell me, you know, Milton, I'm on my own. How could I? I couldn't even raise this. A lot of people, many of the big startups that tend to succeed a lot, if you hear the stories of the people, it tends to be two or three guys coming together. It's so much harder to be on your own to start up something and get it to fly. Our guys, we still feel shy to partner with people. Everyone wants to start their own little thing and all the brain you have is only yours. How can we partner with like-minded people to start up something that flies? And uh, I think the other thing as well in Uganda is uh, we all know that the opportunities that are opening much rapidly tends to be in the area of technology or in the area of tech. A lot of our people are feeling shy to venture into that space. Many people think to start a business which is tech-based, you have to have a tech background. That's far from the truth. You don't have to have a tech background to start a tech-based business. That's where partnerships come into play. That's where the mindset mm. of learning and relearning comes. Because people learn. I'm sure if he shares his story, he will tell you about the many things they had to learn about along the way. So summary, get away from the mindset that a university degree equals a job in a formal environment. 20% of us, or 20% plus or minus, will get that. But the majority, that equation won't work. Secondly, have the courage to think what drives you. Have the courage to pick up friends, people, like-minded people. You know, you talk something about somebody who shares the same passion, the same values, whatever. We have those. Everyone has people with whom they can work. Partner with those guys and don't shy away from tech-based business. That's where the future is. That's where the future is. Either partner with people who have that knowledge or learn it. Because you can't, if you don't go into technology, you are setting up yourself to become obsolete. 
All right, thank you so much. Over to you, John. What are your thoughts on, on the fact that uh, we have high rates of unemployment in the country? Do you think it's as a result of people taking on their third, fourth, fifth choices other than their initial first choice? Thank you. I, th I think um, it's twofold. On one hand is the fundamental issue that we are dealing with. That is less of behavior and more of um, mathematical. The fact is uh, more graduates are coming out than the jobs being created. So that contributes you know, quite substantially to the unemployment with or without skills uh, of, of the people coming out. But then also there is the bigger problem, which is the mindset that, that we have, uh, especially coming out of campus. We feel the world owes us a job and that's where we, we, we start to get it wrong. So you're like, oh, I've had these sleepless nights, I've graduated, where is my job? It doesn't that, uh, work that way. So I think the graduates need to also appreciate the fact that one, uh, in choosing, in making that choice, whether it is first, second, what is driving, what is informing the choices that you're making uh, for the courses that you pursue. Uh, unfortunately, many will look at the uh, research or, or, or grapevine about how this job is more well-paying than the other, how uh, you travel when you're uh, a marketing person and if you're an engineer, maybe not. You know, there are so many misconceptions around uh, the different job markets that, that we have and, and roles. So I think, critically, a graduate needs to understand, before even choosing the course, uh, whether what they are pursuing is in demand, because that is critical, especially in a very dynamic environment. You could start when it is in demand, and by the time you're graduating, perhaps it's not. So that puts you in a position where you need to be a bit agile, and start to think outside that which you've had as a degree or, or, or a diploma, whatever it is. So I think wha what I can say is we have high levels of unemployment because of the fundamental issue that the jobs are not there to absorb the graduates. But on the other hand, the graduates also in a way feel you know, entitled to these jobs, which leads them to a place where they are not willing to expand their knowledge or where they are looking for. So you study journalism and mass communication, and you're only visiting TV stations to, to look for jobs. So, and yet the opportunities are, are quite immense. But also, like Milton said, uh, tech is, is really the in thing now. Uh, Ron said it has been the case before. Yes, COVID has accelerated it now. So we need to also be in sync with the current situation and appreciate the fact that once you graduate and all you're offering is your core degree, the employability is quite um, tricky if you do not have some other tech-related skills and the soft skills that uh, everyone is talking about. All right, so now on a lighter note, we have been all serious telling people, um, telling them what they should do, what they shouldn't do. On a lighter note, and maybe a simpler matter that people take for granted, all of us, Ron, you employ some people. Milton, you do employ some people. John, you are employed, but I'm sure you interact with also people that get employed. Dress code. Can we lightly talk about presentation of a person that walks into the office? You've all been talking about entrepreneurship and we're encouraging entrepreneurship. It's a very good idea. We should be moving in that direction. Get employed, but have something on the side. Uh, add value to everything that you do. Presentation. Do you think young people understand the power of presentation when you enter an employer's office? Over to you, Ron. <laughs> presentation is key for, for the ladies and I'm, the I'm gents. From, I'm from the tech space, I think we have different standards. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's say that's also go first. Uh, no, uh, no, I think it's, it's very important. And uh, now, presentation is not just about how you dress, uh, it's more than dress code. Um, I think presentation is about how you are able to convey your ability to contribute to the business. Yes. 
and uh, but, uh, so, just to cut uh, you short there uh, and, and so, uh, <laughs> just to cut you short there I have, if, I if I have all the ideas yes, to yes, contribute yes. to Jumia I, Uganda I can and I come in dressed with uh, ripped jeans I can and a crop top how my software would you still employ me? no, 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 of course <laughs> not now I'll tell you this, how my software engineers dress is not how our marketing team dresses is not how our commercial team dresses our account managers dress <laughs> So you have to be to understand the space you're in and the, the kind of space you want to get into. Uh, I think more and more uh, companies are moving away from uh, this standard look of the tie and the shirt and, and, and more looking at decency um, and making sure that the employees are comfortable. And so for me, uh, uh, it's understanding the space you want to get into. If you are applying to a bank and you want to get into banking or you want to become a lawyer and you want to work at a law firm, you need to understand that the dress code of a law firm is going to be a specific way. So, coming into office with ties and, and, and shirts, so they need to know what they need to do. But for my account managers, for my marketing team, it's very important because they're interacting with an outside uh, entities that, and that's the, that's the face of Jumia. Uh, for my developers who only see the computers, you know, uh, it's okay to be dressed down. I myself have to say that um, you know, today I'm wearing a jacket, but uh, normally uh, I'm uh, much more dressed down because, again, even I don't really deal with people. Uh, I'm much more comfortable. You are a CEO. Y yes, in the tech space. A CEO in tech business is different from a CEO here. Uh, so, no, uh, the point here is that know what value you convey by, uh, by what you dress. And so an engineer does not need to convey what they offer by dressing up. But most other industries in accounting, in finance, in marketing, almost all this presentation is your first impression. And then this was a serious point indeed, uh, that if you want to get the part, you need to look the part. And so that for me is step one. And so yes, dress code is good, but also how you speak, uh, how you write. You know, at times you get an email from someone and you're like, how would I ever employ you even cannot put together a structured email. Your CV is not uh, well structured in the right way. When you make a phone call to HR or to whoever, you don't speak properly. So there's many things that show who you are and your ability to apply yourself and your ability, to how, how of a hard worker you are based on how you present yourself in communication and in dress code. And that is very, very important. People lose their jobs at the first point of entry and that is emailing your CV coming for an interview and then opening your mouth. All those things need to make sure that they do fit uh, where you want to go. Because impression, the first impression yes. is a lasting one. Yes. Uh, John, um, I wish I could uh, sort of go back and, and see you when you are getting into NSSF just to pick an ideal experience of how you were dressed, how you spoke, and how you entered the reception and actually spoke to the HR. But that brings me to the part where I'm curious to hear from you. In terms of presentation, what can young, young people know about it? I think the key thing is to study the environment in, in which you would like to leave uh, a positive impression. Uh, my background is uh, advertising agencies, then telecos before I came to the fund. In ad agencies, we would you know, put on jeans on a Monday, and it was perfectly fine. Even the CEO uh, or MD wouldn't really mind. You would even go, uh, like, you know, basically dress down any day, any time. At the end of the day, if you're delivering uh, what you're supposed to be delivering, no one minds. But again, even in the agency space, if we had, say, critical client meetings, we are meeting bankers, we are meeting a CEO of a certain company, then there was a dress code that is unsaid but well known by everyone, that if you're going to do a pitch here or pitch there, you need to dress this way. So I think, well, uh, w when I look at NSSF, uh, 
I was in a telco and I could, you know, put on my khaki pants and do my long sleeved shirt on a Monday, uh, not tucked in, and I would even talk to the MD scenario. I knew NSSF uh, is a financial related, it's, it plays in the space of banks. Uh, also, the dress code is, uh, I think, clearly communicated, so you know of, uh, what is expected of you before you even join. If you do some research, you're able to tell. Plus, also, if you look at the uh, NSSF people that uh, make it to the public forums, you can tell how they are dressed, and you kind of get a picture of what the organization requires you to do. So, yes, my first day at NSSF was in a suit. Um, most of my suits actually get old before I use them even three times because I will buy it and do uh, something that requires a suit and I'm back to default mode afterwards. So I think the key thing is to study the environment, understand, because they're known like banks. You just know it's going to be a tie at the very least, if not a suit for some as a must. So you need to study the environment but critically i think it is the content and and not how you present yourself in terms of the the dress code because the worst thing you can do is to dress really nicely and then start talking and oh my god it's the exact opposite of the image you've projected so i think people out there need to focus on the content uh more than even perhaps their dress code Thank you so much, John. And now to the audience, we ask you that if you have any questions that you would like uh, our panelists to, to talk about or even clarify on or give you some advice, do send us your questions on our social media platforms. We'll be delighted. We'll be looking forward to having those questions posed to our panelists and we get the same feedback back to you. Now, once again, we do want to remind you that we're giving out amazing prizes today. We have jumpers, we have Jumia vouchers, we have MyFires, we have data. All that is going to be going to you. A hundred students, a hundred online viewers today will be getting some presents. So everybody is likely to be a winner. Even us, the panelists, I think at some point uh, the NSSF should be having <laughs> some presents <laughs> for us. <laughs> but uh, there is something that I personally want to say we all need to ha to register for NSSF. You see, when you're getting into an empl an employment space, uh, or if you're getting employed anywhere, they'll ask you for the NSSF number. Now, it's very important that out of this interaction, you get yourself one. And if there's anything I've learned over time, when you're in school, you're not desperate for some reason. You're in a better position to get things than when you're out of school. So this is your chance to use every single opportunity that is thrown at you. I'll be sharing with you how to get out to register your NSSF uh, for NSSF. And I can do that actually quickly. Um, all we ask that you dial star 254 hash and uh, choose register member, then follow the prompts. I'm reading it just to make sure I'm telling you the right <laughs> number to do, to dial star 254 hash and of course go ahead to choose register member, then follow the prompts or even then download the NSSF Go app to register. It is much, much easier, but you need your ID number with you because it is a requirement. So I hope you have an ID, but I'm sure you do. You indicate all those details there. And of Later, why you should know that uh, registering for NSSF is key, once you're registered as an a NSSF member, when you get into the employment space, they will ask you and your employer will be putting some kamani that you use later in, in the future. So it's important that you do it right away. You never know when an employment opportunity actually kicks in. That said, and then there's some questions that we've been getting online. But I do not want to forget Milton because <laughs> he's the key person that we are having on the panel today in terms of human resource employment and all that. Presentation, Mr. Will Milton Award. How important is it? Are there people that, uh, for instance, on a lighter note <laughs> that have entered your office and from the very first time you see them, you're like, this one, it won't happen. Over to you. Thank you. I think that's a very important question because uh, they say first impressions are the most important. Yes. Once you start on a wrong note, it's a lot harder to come back to the positive than the other way around. My colleagues have answered the question on dress code very well. It's, it's how you choose to present yourself. 
the way you dress, you're actually communicating. And it speaks to your emotional intelligence. Because before you walk into a bank or before you walk into a tech company, you should have the intelligence to know what sort of environment am I working in. Yeah. So that is so very important. I can tell you a few examples of what I've seen in the last couple, in, in, in the years I've been doing HR. Uh, and a lot of employers are doing it uh, more and more frequently. In my own personal experience, part of the interviews I did when I was doing my first job with BAT, it was not just about the dress code, but how you socialize. So what the guys did to us uh, as the final stage of the interview was to take us to a lavish restaurant where we are allowed to drink whatever you want, eat whatever you want, and uh, you know just have fun, basically. As you can imagine, young students at Makerere, we could hardly afford certain quality of wine. Some people could only dream of certain levels of whiskeys and whatever. So long story short, some people lost opportunities just because of how they conducted themselves. They took it like, this is my opportunity to drink everything I can, and they got messed up. I've seen people coming to my office with very good academic papers, and the way the lady dresses, you wonder whether is this, are we going to a nightclub, are we going for a, an outing, or what are we going for? It cre you, you're communicating something by the way you dress. And that's where I call it emotional intent. Please make a judgment call for the kind of meeting you're going for. What is the ideal, what is the appropriate dressing and the, the institution you're going into? Two weeks ago, we were having, uh, we were going with our board. I'm sure you guys know Pension Towers, the new tall building NSSF is building, which is going to be the tallest in, in the country. And uh, we had a couple of dignitaries invited to help because we we're going to go right up to the top. I think there are 43 floors. You can imagine some people came in with day pursuits for that. And you know you're going for a site visit. What does that talk about your emotional intelligence and your sense of judgment? So I think what I can say is people should use their intelligence to judge what is appropriate for that occasion for that occasion and for that institution that you're visiting you know the, the dress you covered you don't come to to a potential employer with ripped jeans and those cuts with blouses which come up to the top doesn't look right or you don't come with a dress which goes up to very high up it looks nice but it's for a different occasion Thank you so much, uh, Milton, for that submission. So there you have it. Uh, first impression is key. It's very important to do due diligence, really, and find out what do you, what are you going to do? What kind of people am I going to meet? What are their colors? What do they like doing? Now, for instance, me, I knew we were going to have a red chair. So I had to pick <laughs> a dress with a bit of red. And I also know um, NSSF has blue, so probably tomorrow I will look for a blue outfit. So anyway, it's very important to think of all that and more. Once again, do remember to register for NSSF. It's very key when you're getting employed. They'll always ask for your number. Do download the NSSF Go app. Get onto your phone, Apple Store, or any other, and register right away. But you can also dial star 254 hash and follow the prompts. Now, diving into the questions today, it's very important to hear the thoughts of, of, uh, of the viewers. We do have... Um, um, Osbert Arenitwe, who is actually sending the question to Mr. John, and they're asking that what is your take on the current employment world to ask the youth who have passion, passions on the different courses, but did other courses at universities and they're not employed with the courses they have now? What could be the best advice to such students? That is Osbert Arenitwe sending us this question on our social media platforms. Do keep these questions coming through. Over to you, John. Please respond to Osbert at any way. All right, so um, I think we, we can address it from the point of uh, answering what is in demand now. Uh, and like everyone has said, um, a lot of tech-related jobs are in demand because um, the, the world is growing. One of the drivers of tech uh, <laughs> anywhere in the world, but especially in Uganda, is one 
uh, affordability of the devices. Uh, the devices are getting cheaper by the day, mobile phone devices, if I'm to be specific. The data access, uh, so infrastructure has been laid. So we are growing really fast uh, as a country. And companies have also warmed up to, to technology, uh, largely, you know, accelerated by COVID-19 because here they didn't have a choice. They had to automate, they had to go e, uh, in, in a very short span. So I think what I would tell OSBAT and anyone who finds themselves in, in that dilemma, you started this course but you're realizing the demand is elsewhere, is to just upskill. If I'm to limit myself to what I know best, digital marketing, there are so many resources online. Uh, I highly recommend um, a course called Digital Skills for Africa. It basically gives you a crash course on digital marketing covering all the areas. Uh, the bit about all these courses like Digital Skills for Africa, Academy for Ads by Google, uh, Twitter Flight School, Facebook Blueprints, and so many others is they'll give you certification. These certificates are recognized globally. So you kind of have uh, a certification on one hand, but also critical skills that are responding to the current demand on the other. So I think I would encourage him, and you see, they are free. You'll just need to invest time, uh, some bit of data here. It is self-paced, so even if you're up and about, you can start and stop and start again whenever you feel like. So at the end of the day, if you were serious also, but about pursuing that direction, in a month or two, you'll get a, a digital certification that you can add to your CV, but importantly, away from the papers that gives you the skills that are needed and are in demand at the moment. So it's really upskilling themselves over and above you know, the graduation they had uh, wherever it happened. All right, uh, thank you so much, John. And it takes back it takes us back to the conversation we've been having of adding value, you know, doing all the other social skills, being able to to bring to the table something more than just your degree, not so. So I do hope that also, but that has been answered well and clear. But if it hasn't, you can still ask again. Now Mole Grace says that uh, Mr. Kawamana, how do you handle the pressure of competition from the so many people? you found in the industry a media personnel it so happens that we have not gotten a chance to learn from these people uh grace i think you're saying mr kawamara how do you handle the pressure uh, of competition from the so many people you found in the industry what i don't understand he she's also saying and media personnel it so happens that we have not gotten a chance to learn from these people i want to believe you got that right i will, I will answer the competition aspect uh, the thing is that um, yeah, we good thing we didn't find anyone in the market when we came, but over time uh, we've gotten multiple uh, competitors, which is great. Now I want to remind for those people who were around before Facebook, there was a company called MySpace. MySpace was the original social media platform that was there. And before Samsung and before iPhones, there was uh, BlackBerry. BlackBerry was the first uh, uh, smartphone. Now, fast forward to today, Samsung and Apple have dominated the smartphone industry and other players. Uh, today, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter have dominated the social media landscape. So for me, my view on competition is that it's not about being fast. It's about being best. And so my view on this is that for as long as we are not giving a superior experience, competition will take us. Um, and we've seen that in this market, uh, companies who did not adjust quickly enough, who would not respond to customer needs. And so the only way I compete, and the only reason I t tell my, my team to always make sure that you are doing it the best not doing it the fast because yes you can claim we're the fast ones we're the biggest but it doesn't matter if you're not doing it the best so be be best and i think it's also even for in employment it's not just getting the job it's making sure that uh, you're as good as you can be and that you've built resilience in your career because we've seen in the last one year when COVID happened many companies fired employees they downsized but not everybody was downsized so what's the difference between those who are downsized and those who stayed behind 
and, th and those who stayed behind. And the difference is that those who stayed behind were those who had built resilience in their skills, who had made themselves indispensable to the business. So uh, I think we need to remain indispensable in our businesses, in our careers, in our jobs, in our schools, and that makes a difference. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ron Kawamara, for that submission. Uh, Grace, I hope your question has been answered, and I personally do know that if you want to compete favorably, you should do the best, but do it consistently, over and over again, and do it so well. The next question goes to uh, Mr. Milton Owaru, and this is coming from Pius Kusima, who says that, thank you so much, Mr. Wal Martin. Uh, you know, when you're speaking to an HRA, you have to start by saying thank you for allowing me come to your office. Well, how should students that have just gotten out of university handle the anxiety that comes with searching for a job after campus, especially when they do not know where they will be and are financially disturbed? Wow. <coughs> yes, I, c I know that anxiety. I know how it feels. And uh, it's very easy to feel lost and almost to feel without hope. When you finish campus, you are ready to get it. You're ready to start working, but there's no work for you to do. So the anxiety comes in. So how do you do it? I think <coughs> in the conversations we had today, uh, it was made very clear. The last thing you want to do is to do nothing. The last thing you want to do is to do nothing. And I am lucky to be having similar conversations with a lot of young students, young men and young women who come to see me because they want a job and we don't have a job immediately. There are things you can do to keep your brain working and to enable you to continue to acquire skills. The first one, volunteer, even if it's for free, volunteer to work with somebody. We are people I know, especially the smaller businesses, that desperately want additional manpower, but they are too small to afford all the manpower that they need. How about volunteering to, to, to intern with them, even if it's only for the 10,000 she was talking about, or even if it's just for the cup of tea? That's one thing you can do. The second thing you can do is to use that space to upskill yourself. Today, there are so many online courses which are almost free that are affordable to almost everyone else. We all know the world of tomorrow is about technology. The world of tomorrow is about data, data science, data analytics. I got some statistics I was going to share with you. Those are things you can learn within periods of two months, three months, four months, and you acquire new skills. When I was working uh, in Nairobi, a lot of my friends were in what they call the gig economy. They are sitting in Kenya, in Nairobi, but their clients are in the US, they are in China, they are in India, they are in Singapore. They have never met any single one of their clients, but they wake up in the morning, they sit on their computer. Some of them even started by sitting in a cafe, a computer, a cyber cafe. They couldn't even afford a personal laptop. You go to a cyber cafe, and somebody is asking you to do things for them. You know, there's one I know who very much impressed me. A lady, she started by, uh, she started by helping people to write their CVs. You know, there are so many people who want, who have the right skills, but they don't know how to package their CVs. So all that this person could do is go into the various websites. There are many websites that teach how to write CVs. So she learned it well enough to be able to do it for other people. So she was writing CVs for people all over the world. Before she realized, she was now doing research for people. People who are doing PhDs, masters, they don't have time to go around doing whatever. So they sent to her stuff, and she was doing it. Before long, she had a whole office of people in the gig economy. I think Uganda, we are lagging behind a lot. Rwanda is doing it better than us. Kenya certainly is doing it better than us. In our region, apart from Burundi, Uganda is at the back in terms of leveraging the gig economy. So those are things which I would encourage you to do. Acquire a skill in the field of technology, acquire a skill in the field of data, 
position yourself. I think you mentioned it very well. How do you market yourself on the cyberspace? You might not get immediate employment with a Ugandan company, but somebody in India will notice that you have certain skills that they can buy one hour of your life every day for $200 every day. You start small, you grow. Start small and then grow. And I think the other thing that I, 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 I pick from your submission is that as a young person, you can identify what people are not exploiting. Like when you mentioned the CVs, you look around and you see what is that one thing that someone else is not doing that I can do, even if it's not in relation to what I studied, but how about I try it? And you never know it could actually come or uh, come out well. Now, we do have more thoughts because we are running out of time. I would like our submissions to be a bit short so that we respond to as many questions as possible. And this, I want to throw it to all of us today. Uh, Moses Chidongwe is saying that, dear Sandra, can one of the speakers talk about the statement, talk about yourself? What basics do I need to talk about myself during an interview? I have personally, when I was looking for a job, I've, I've entered a room with like four or five uh, people and they've just said, oh, hi, how are you? Talk about yourself. How do you start? I'll start with you, Ron. You've gone through a number of internships, but even internships, they ask you to talk about yourself. How do you go about that and how do you make sure that in your talking about yourself, it's very outstanding? Well, I think um, when they ask to talk about yourself, um, what they're looking for is what do you hold important to you? Because obviously, you know your name, and we know that. We know that you know what you studied. You tell us about your experience, so the jobs you've done. But what we want to see is what is important about your, your, your education, what's important about your job, what's important about your experience. So um, what... Uh, I look favorably on, on a personal note, is somebody who's able to tie their education, their background, um, their job experience, their interest, make it relevant to what they want to do now. So uh, it's, it's trying to find a point of connection. I think uh, most employers are, are looking to hire people who are, are like them. Because uh, when I started uh, with Hello Food, the people I hired are people who had similar attributes to myself. And, and, and you get those by asking that question. And so the point is not to try to embellish your achievement or to embellish your, what you've done, the school you went to, the degree you got. The point is to explain how that has made you to be today and, and how that will help you uh, in, in uh, achieving what you want to do today. So find a balance between not giving us a narrative of what you've been, but more is what you've learned along the way is, is, is important. Thank yeah. you so much, Ron. Uh, John Senkizi, what, first of all, in your own experience, have you ever been asked to talk about yourself? Oh, yes. Uh, almost every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just paint for us a scenario of what you said <laughs> when they asked you to talk about yourself. I think when the question is asked, what comes to mind is uh, two things. Mm -hmm. On one end, I need to address the job fit element yes. uh, at that point in time, in which case I will talk about uh, what I've studied and uh, the previous jobs I've held. But in the context of either the organization uh, where I'm applying or the job itself. So I would focus on if, for example, I was head of so-and-so in company X, I wouldn't dwell much on the title and how big it was, but what projects I undertook when I was there that kind of uh, helped me to grow professionally, helped the company grow, and that kind of, re it makes it relatable from a job fit point of view. You also look at the JD that was sent to you. If there is something you can speak to, uh, in relation to the job description for the job you're applying for, it's a plus. But on the other, I think there is also the culture fit. 
uh, each company has their own culture. So if you read up and understand what their values are, what their mission is, what their vision is, and you could then address certain elements about you that show that you are actually a fit of, of that company culture. I think that sets you apart. Uh, and also, like Kron says, helps to give the employer or potential employer insight into whether you're someone who is going to gel in with the already existing workforce or it will take a lot of behavior change resources to get you there. Yeah. To get you in order, in other words. All right, uh, thank you so much, John Sankizi. Uh, over to you, Milton. Or it's very intentional for me to, for some questions to leave you at the end, uh, just for you know why. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but that's fine. I think my colleagues have said it all. It's about the job fit. When they ask you to talk about yourself, tell us about you in the context of why you think you're the best person for this job. So whether it's about your ed education, whether it's your ex relevant experience, whether it's about your personal values, this is your chance to market yourself, to show that you're the best in it. The thing which people normally miss is failing to use that opportunity to demonstrate that your job fit is better than all the other candidates who have also talked about themselves. So find something, some unique value proposition that you bring to the table that you think other people might not have brought. So that separates you from the crowd, how you fit into the job. But in addition to that, what's the unique value proposition that you bring? People um, forget that. If in, in staying with that question, because I think it's a very important question. So many people always wonder what to say. I just want to give me one key word one keyword, all of you, something that will stay in the minds of people, that when you're talking about yourself, this is what you should have at the back of your mind. Is it the company values? Is it who you are, the impact you, you can create? Or is it just um, what you bring to the table? I'll start with Ron. Keyword that people should remember when they're talking about themselves. Not a sentence, just a keyword. Um. It's not a sentence. It's a, a key word so to, that describes you as an individual. Uh, when you're talking about, yeah, when you're talking about yourself. Oh, I think, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, depending on the profession, if I was a digital marketing specialist, I'd say, hey, my name is Ron, I'm a digital marketing expert. I have actually given uh, categories. Yes. Uh, should it be, because all of you pointed out, you say yeah. that when you're talking about introducing yourself, you should either talk about what you've gone through to get uh. to that position. So let us break it down to make it easier for the young people to remember. When you're talking about yourself, should you focus more on the impact you're bringing to the company? Should you bring in the aspect of the values of the company or the things you've gone through or why you need that money? Because there are some people who say, I'm Sandra Twinobio, I am this and this, and I'm looking for money to pay for rent. So what are some of those things that, the key word that young people shouldn't forget? Because one, you need to introduce yourself. So I am the digital marketing expert and, and um, I'm applying for this position because I believe I can do X. I can increase your, your amount of usage by this much because I have gone through this and this and I've done this and I've, I believe therefore I can give you X results. And so you never, it's very difficult to reduce it to one line. I think it's about tying your ability to the company objectives in tangible ways that they Precisely. can find credible. That is the key word. Yes. Tying? You can say that again for <laughs> all of us today. <laughs> no, you can repeat. Uh, you can say the last yeah. statement, uh, tying your company values, the company values to what you bring to the table, because that's a very key thing that young people may not forget. Yes, indeed. No, it's, it's tying your abilities to uh, the company objectives. Uh, tying your abilities in, to the company objectives. In, in, in tangible ways that they can measure and see from that communication. All right. Thank you so much, John. Keyword for, for this question, introduce yourself. I think I would sum it up in one word. Uh, what sets you apart? Because you see jobs are advertised with a minimum qualification. So if you bring your paper, perhaps guys have stronger papers than, than you do. 
So if given the <coughs> holding other factors constant, like education and experience, what sets you apart? And that will be basically uh, what you think you've done or you can do that, like Ron says, is in line with the company objectives at the time. Now, you see the company objectives are in a trickle-down effect. Uh, so you play your part, the other guys play their part. So how will you play? What sets you apart to play your part in this bigger picture that is the company objective? Okay, great. And finally, Mr. Milton. I think it's been said. If somebody can answer that question by saying two things. One, yes, my, my name is Milton. Two, NSSF, I know this is what you're trying to achieve. Three, this is how I'll bring impact for you to achieve those things. That you want it. Very important aspect that you bring in, the end goal of yes. why they should employ you. Yes. There you have it. When you're introducing yourself, bring in all those aspects. Thank you so much, our panelists. Now, moving on with more questions. Remember, our hashtag is NSSF. Expo 2021 on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, on Zoom. When you comment, when you, you ask a question, please use that hashtag. Remember, there are prizes to be won. So all of us are going to walk our winners today. We are looking to reward 100 students that will have logged into today's Expo. We are carrying on this Expo for the next two days. Today has been the very first day. As we continue to conclude our conversation today, I'll go through, break it down again, the themes, the sub-themes, so that you have it at the back of your mind. Now, looking at other questions that we are having on, uh, that are coming through from our students watching us today, I'll pick... Um, uh, Nabude Shiba says, and this goes to you, Mr. Kawamara. For example, me, I got done with my studies in 2017. That's when I graduated. How am I going to take on those number of internships mm? when I'm not in university anymore? Because, yes, I would love to continue taking, th taking them on. But when my scripts read that I'm done with the university, thank you. Um, indeed, it's a, it's a difficult situation being unemployed now that's coming to three years. But what's the alternative? Huh? The alternative is that you have three years of doing nothing. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're not building your skill set at a time when others are building theirs, it means that you're gradually sinking. So in the last three years that uh, that individual has not been working or doing an internship, she has become less attractive for employment than if she had taken an unpaid internship. The reality of the matter is that uh, you still have to live. Uh, whether you're working or not, you still have to survive in Kampala and Uganda. Why not survive while at the same time building your network while at the same time? And so I had the same scenario when I finished, when I graduated, and I did internship for two years unpaid. Um, and I can tell you that um, it's, it's the best substitute when you don't have employment. I would, I would absolutely recommend that, of course, sh she continues to, to search for a job, but in the meantime that she's doing something. When you come for an interview and you present your credentials and tell me, actually, I've not found a full-time job, but in the meantime, I've been interning here and here, and this is what I've gained, and this is what I'm looking to contribute to your company. It has more weight, it shows initiative, it shows uh, somebody who's focused than somebody who graduated three years ago and has not had any additional experience. That's powerful, thank you so much, Ron. Now, more thoughts coming through. Good morning, Sandra and uh, the panelists. My question is that uh, with, with all the enterprises that our panelists lead, head, are there any graduate training placements I am asking this because I'm a recent graduate with a degree in IT, and I really want to grow my career in that path. And all the places I have applied to really want me to have over three years experience, which I do not have. Panelists, please help. I, I think I need to get the right name of this uh, person. Uh, probably get it later. I wasn't able to capture that. But yes, this is the question they're asking are there any internship training placements? I actually really like young people that are very quick to grab opportunities. You know, when you see an opportunity like this, jump onto it. 
that's when you get placements. So here we have it. We have uh, a digital marketing expert, CEO, Jumia Uganda. We have an HR. Ha, we also have John Senkizi. So really, we have the opportunity to get a chance to get one or two placements. Over to you, John. I'll start with you. Are there any internship placements in IT? Uh, I think Milton is best positioned to answer that one. Uh, what I do as John in, in my individual capacity is I, I take on, you know, uh, especially young people uh, to, to mentor them. Uh, luckily, they are paid mentorships. But again, as a person, I can only do so much, uh, really. Yeah, so Milton is best positioned to take on that mm -hmm. and run. But but just maybe because I know you you're very passionate about young people and guiding them into different places here and there and making decisions, you could have places in your mind that you think they could start checking out, and we could benefit from you that way. Yeah. So what I do is um, I maintain quite some uh, solid presence online, especially yeah. LinkedIn. So if the guys could follow LinkedIn, I always get so many requests uh, from, from different individuals asking me for a digital person who does that, a digital person who does that, and I always post these. Uh, so I'd encourage them to, uh, there is a digital um, group on Facebook, it's called Digital Learning Hub. Uh, we post so many jobs there, but unfortunately they're all in line of digital, but you can upskill and take them up. I also post a number of jobs on, on my LinkedIn as and when they come. But then also I try and, um, you know, internship doesn't have to be within an office setting. You can actually get interned by, um, you know, interacting with individuals, learning from their experiences, and these opportunities are quite immense. So I would advise such people to join uh, things like the Rotaract Club because it, you know, has so many opportunities to network, mm -hmm. to meet uh, so many uh, senior people in different companies, which, you know, kind of opens your possibilities up. So join the Rotary Club. Um, if you're fairly older, join Rotary itself. Uh, you know, look online. You know, one thing we have to appreciate is that these days, Back in the days, it was a common scenario where you say, I, I've walked these Kampala streets and even my soul is worn out looking for a job. These days with the World Wide Web, there is a job posted each and every single day. So I would encourage people to check out these jobs. The unfortunate bit is they think these jobs are filled and the advertisements are just for sure, but uh, these jobs are not filled in most cases. Mm -hmm. So just search online. There are so many job forums. I uh, look through the papers. I think Monday and Friday, Vision and Daily Monitor, and you know, apply. And the beauty is you'll just package your CV nicely. Uh, you ha add the cover letter to it and email. So you don't have to walk to a company. You can also do some, you know, proactive, you know, searching. A company has not advertised, but they leave their HR contact details. Some of the companies actually compile these CVs and then they get into a pool from which the company then sources. So they just have to be a bit more uh, uh, proactive. They will get the jobs. Okay, thank you so much, John. Uh, from my own experience, I would just say something. There's, uh, there's so much power in having a mentor, you know. W you, as young people watching us today, you need to ask yourself, what kind of mentor do I need in my life? And then look for that mentor. Do not be scared to text them, to call them, to send them an Instagram uh, message or something. Send them and ask them, can you please be my mentor? You see, what happens with getting a mentor, sometimes you meet for coffee, they'll be meeting other people. And then they will introduce you. They will introduce you to different fields. They will introduce you to different categories of people. So that could contribute to you helping you get a, an internship placement. So do think about it. Get mentors because it's a very key aspect that you need in order to, to succeed. It has worked for me and I'm just telling you. Uh, so I hope it works for you as well. Now, Ron, this is IT we are talking about. Do you think... You, as Mr. Ron Ramrama, on behalf of the students, you have any internship placements? And if not, where can our people, our young people, look for these internship placements? Well, one thing I've realized um, is that uh, a lot of companies uh, do not have a streamlined process or structure around internships. Um, a lot of companies 
do it in an ad hoc way. So which means that uh, there's very limited visibility in what's available for young people looking for internships. Uh, unfortunately, uh, companies have not uh, seen themselves yet as, as a big part of the social impact. So the responsibility then falls on the individual looking for internships. Even when you're not, uh, there's nothing advertised, very many times uh, companies, HR, you know, different departments have opportunity to absorb uh, internship requests, um, especially if uh, they do not add a lot to their bottom line. So it's very important that uh, young people don't see um, internships as a way to, to, to earn an income. That's the misunderstanding. I've seen people who come in and, and you know, at Dreamia when we provide internships, we, we give them just enough to cover their transport. And uh, in some cases, yeah, but um, so I thought I'm gonna get 1.5 to million, you know. So the expectation is, is different. And so consequently, when there's that narrative, a lot of companies will not be open to giving opportunity for young people to, to, to learn and grow. So don't come with a lot of expectations. Come with the expectation that you want to learn the culture, the skills, and learn from the people in that organization. And two, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, and uh, the people who get the opportunities are people who ask, who reach out, and write to HR, and write to the managers, and write to whoever they can. Is there an opportunity? This is my CV, this is my skill set. I really want to learn from Jumia. And, and very often, um, the, there's an opportunity for them to take. And we see also a lot of managers then want to hire people who already have that company culture. So at Jumia, for example, the majority of all entry-level positions are people who came in as interns. Before we recruit from outside, we look through our interns and see okay, who deserves to be promoted to full-time. And so, and I'm sure many companies are taking the same approach. So if you want to get your foot in the door, don't look for salary, look for, for experience. So uh, I ask and I encourage people to, if you are interested to learn from NSF or from MTN or for whoever you want to learn from, reach out. There's, you, there's no loss in reaching out. There's no loss in, 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 in writing to HR and writing to the managers um, and, and trying to see if there's opportunity for internship, opportunity to learn. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ron Kawamara. Uh, and now over to Milton, and this is going to, sadly, I do not think majority of us want to end this session, but this is going to be a very last uh, co uh, statement or conversation to conclude our interaction today. Are there any placements at NSSF? This is a question that was asked, and they continue to say, could you please point out some areas that you're still struggling with here at NSSF so that the young people watching us today can look at? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. NSSF has always been taking an average of uh, 100 interns every year uh, in the different sections. We partner with the universities. I don't know where that person, uh, which university it is, but most of the universities, we partner with them, and we take an average of 100 every year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of COVID-19, where we've asked about 60% of our staff to work from home, because we are trying to decongest the office, it makes it not practical for us to, to have interns in-house. Only yesterday, uh, yesterday, yeah, yesterday, I'll, I'll say it, I hope my colleagues in marketing don't mind. <coughs> There was one of the universities where somebody was marketing this career expo and uh, they erroneously made a false promise in marketing by saying those who attend uh, the career expo stand a chance to be given internships and they will be, so I saw it, somebody saw it and they brought it to me. We can't do it because we are decongesting the office. Even if we were to ask people to intern from home, it would mean getting laptops for every one of them. That's not practical. The two things I tell people uh, who are in the situation like the lady of IT, I got somebody coming to see me towards the end of last year, uh, an IT person, incidentally, who desperately wanted to do work with us. We didn't have something for him to do. And then we got into some kind of coaching conversation 
And at the end of it, the challenge I was putting to him is, uh, if you cannot get a paying job now, and you got your IT skills, is there a way you can make somebody see the value you can bring for them? You know, where do you stay? He told me stay somewhere in Chireka. Where? What are the businesses around you? He says there's a petrol station next to where I live. I said, try going to that petrol station. Ask them how do they do their records? How do they manage their order? Is there something you can leverage your IT skills to help them improve? People are trying to automate record keeping. People are trying to automate their. Part. Can you volunteer? He went to that petrol station. He volunteered to help them. Uh, he helped them to help them get their records automated. He did that for one month without pay. The second month, the guys had seen the value of how managing records, which are computerized, how easy it is for them, how more efficient it is. They started paying him to help him to help them do the rest of the records. When he finished, they are now asking him to do other things. So, it starts by going to somebody who hasn't called you but telling them you know what i have this it skill i can help you automate your records i can help you automate the way you do your requisitions you know some people still fill up the form to take to this manager to sign to, i can help you get that done online do it for one month they will see the value and they will want to keep you second and the last one is Many companies I know these days do have the few openings are advertised in their websites. What a lot of our young people don't know is that if you went into NSSF website or Coca-Cola or Jumia or any of the other multinational or any other organization you want to, there are always links where you can set up to automatically get updates on your phone. Whenever any opportunity comes, it comes on your phone. So some people still look for jobs either through newspapers or hope one day I'll chance it to, the day I go to Coca-Cola website is when there will be a job waiting. Set up to as many, all you have to do is go to LinkedIn, the companies that you're interested in, set up auto reminders. As soon as a job is advertised there, you get it. So I think in terms of answering the question, that's all I would say. Thank you so much, uh, thank you so much our panelists this very first day of the expo. Uh, if there was an audience, I would ask them to clap, so I'm going to clap for you myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for being generous for with your time. Two hours, uh, giving it to the young people to learn, to pick ideas on how to excel in this life. Do remember that this expo is going on for the next three days. Uh, for the next two days now that we've gotten one out of the way. It's been amazing. I hope you've learned and picked something from this conversation. A very sub-theme today has been, uh, of course, we told you we have three sub-themes, and uh, today has been guided by purposing new ideas and opportunities beyond the university degree. So many things have been said in, in terms of how you present yourself, in how in terms of how you, you actually show up and work, social skills. Don't just sit back at home and wait for that uh, you know, email. There's some people that say they send so many emails and they never receive any back. So as you're waiting for that email that says you, congratulations, as you wait for that, please do something, add value to you so that by the time you get into an organization, you have value that you're going to add to them. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. John Senkizi, uh, who's the digital supervisor here at NSSF. Thank you, uh, Mr. Milton Owar, who is the head of, of human resource and administration here at NSSF for sharing with us your knowledge on how we young people, how young people can position themselves and get employment internship placements. Thank you so much, Ron Kawamara, for sharing with us your diverse knowledge on how you've managed to excel. You, you really did push ahead your Jumia app and it has worked and we thank you so much. I do hope that young people can follow each one of us on social media, each one of you on social media to get more mentorship. Mentorship is key. So I don't know if in a second you can let them know how they can find you either on LinkedIn, Twitter. How can they find you in just a second? Yeah, um, LinkedIn and uh, Ron Kawamara, I think I come up. Uh, and uh, Twitter is at Ron Kawamara. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Milton? LinkedIn, Milton Award, uh, uh, which is the same at Milton Award for Twitter. John Senkez, um, LinkedIn, Jason Kezi at 
uh, on Twitter, which is another thing I want to drive to the guys out there. Don't call yourself uh, Pinky what on online you need to use your real name as you can see he's milton on social media he's ron we are not maybe swag john or something <laughs> thank you so much john for that it's very important to have the right uh, content that describes who you are in case people are looking for you once again to as we come to the end of a very first day of the expo do remember to register for the nssf google play or apple store nssf go up you'll be right able to register for that and, and become a member so that when you get into the employment space, you are catered for. And also, we have amazing rewards. Yeah. So do not worry that you've spared your 22 uh, hours. No, there's so much that is coming your way. A hundred students are going to be rewarded for participating today. All you have to do is answer the question, uh, the two quiz questions we asked you. One, we asked you to tell us the two, three, uh, the two speakers for the next day two and day three. So go to our social media platforms and send us those names and we'll be right there to reward you. The people that will be successful in this quiz will be contacted when and how to receive their gifts. And again, we have a survey that you have to fill in. We just want to pick your thoughts. If you found this session very useful for you, did you find th the, our discussion very important for you? Did it guide you in purposing your career goals to the new normal? Do you feel that you've learned so much today? So the survey is going to be there. And the beauty about it is that once you take part of the survey, you'll be able to get a certificate as well. So very important, all certificates that you get are key in getting you further in your career career. So that said, remember to register for NSSF, do the survey and comment, send us your questions. Some of the things that have not been answered here will be answered online. It's been amazing. Things to take away from this, position yourself in such a way that someone does not want to let you go. You know, add value so much to the extent that someone just feels they cannot do without you. Every other thing that you're doing is important step by step, you get to the place you want to get to. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. I've been your moderator, and I'll be your moderator for the next two days. I'm equally looking forward for the next group of panelists that we have. We'll be looking at, uh, tomorrow is day two, and we'll be looking at, uh, just to read for you the theme for tomorrow. Um, just a second. Tomorrow is another day, so do not be tempted to not show up tomorrow. <laughs> More presents will be coming your way as well. Day two is going to be themed matching your capabilities with the new changing world. A world that ha now has COVID-19, a world that is working in a technological era. It's important to know how to match your capabilities with that. Thank you so much. I've been your moderator. Continue to learn. Continue to be open to the possibilities that are out there for you. Have yourselves a wonderful day.